Well, good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to you to church today. My name's Andrew. I'm a member of the morning service here at St Andrews, and a special warm welcome to you if you're new or visiting us here today, either here in person or online. Uh, you may be here because you have been invited to our three-week series entitled The Story That Changes Everything. And if that's you, thank you for giving up your Sunday morning to be with us. Uh, we're certainly glad you did, and we want you to feel right at home. Uh, we're excitedly expecting a larger than usual attendance today, so just to let you know, there's an overflow room uh, downstairs in our Kelman room, which is outside and down the stairs, and that's a good space, especially if uh, you're a parent with uh, a baby and you'd like a bit of extra space as well. Now, our guest speaker today for this series and the next three, uh, the three weeks is the Reverend Dr. John Dixon. Uh, who is well known to uh, some of us as he was the former senior minister of this church. But John now leads uh, the Undeceptions Ministry as a podcaster, historian, author, lecturer and advocate for the Christian faith in the public space. Uh, obviously, John's passions uh, span a few fields. Uh, in fact, I should mention his former life as a singer in a rock band, uh, although I believe his podcasts are charting even higher than his rock band albums did. <laughs> but for many of us, though, John is simply our friend and brother in Christ, and so we really welcome him and thank him today. Uh, now, to call this series The Story That Changes Everything, uh, it's a pretty big claim, isn't it? Uh, I remember... Oh, by the way, please take a seat. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> to call this series The Story That Changes Everything is a pretty big claim. I remember waking up on the morning after September 11, 2001 to a newspaper headline uh, in massive, big black capital letters that said, The Day That Changed Everything. Uh, but in a book titled Days That Changed the World, one historian, Howard Williams, lists September 11 as just one of 50 such events alongside events like the death of Genghis Khan, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and the fall of the Berlin Wall. But the interesting thing is, Williams also includes the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as just another one of the 50 big events that changed the world. Is the story of Jesus just another important historical event? Is it indeed a historical event? Does it really change everything? If you'd like answers to these big questions, then strap yourself in for the next three weeks as John brings us the story that changes everything. In just a few moments, we'll have part of the Bible read out to us from the Gospel of Mark, which John will be speaking about. But after John speaks, we've set aside a good amount of time for your questions. So if you'd like to ask John a question about anything he says today, please text your questions through to the number that is on the screen now. Uh, John loves honest questions, so feel free to send them in. But for now, please feel right at home as Marina will be bringing us our Bible reading from the Gospel of Mark. Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning's Bible reading is from the book of Mark, uh, chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1 to 20. Um, I'll just give you a few seconds to grab your devices um, or uh, the spot in the Bible if you want to follow. Mark 1, beginning at verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. 
After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with a hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. How fun. A big thank you to Mal. Where are you, Mal? He's COVID Marshall. Um, some reckon, you know, it's weird to have a former rector uh, sit in the pews as I, I do at 5 p.m. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm in Sydney. Uh, some would think it's even weirder for the new guy to invite the old guy uh, to come and preach a series. But it's uh, just a credit to Mal that this doesn't feel weird at all, at least to us two. I don't know about you. Uh, it just feels lovely. And especially given our topic, how the story that has been told in this place for 108 years and around the world for 2,000 years changes everything. Now, uh, that expression is not just the sort of thing you'd expect from a preacher. Ah, Jesus changes everything. It is increasingly an observation made by some of the leading secular intellectuals of the last 10 to 20 years. Um, Just the other day, I had the great privilege of interviewing uh, for my podcast one of the best-selling history writers in the world. Uh, today. This is Tom Holland, and not to be confused with the Tom Holland actor who plays Spider-Man. Tom Holland has done some very nerdy things, like he's uh, translated the ancient Greek writer Herodotus for the Penguin Classics uh, series, maybe not so popular, but he's best known for these massive, sweeping historical surveys of things like the Persian Empire, the Greeks, the Romans, the rise of Islam, the Dark Ages, and and so on. But his latest bestseller is this one, Dominion, how the Christian revolution remade the world. And of course, that's the one I wanted to chat to him about uh, in the podcast. Here's the thing, Holland is not a Christian. But he made quite a splash about five years ago by publishing this article, got a lot of controversial attention, where he said that it had just dawned on him that the values his secular intellectual set live by, uh, charity, equality, human rights, can only have come into the Western world through Christianity. I know that's, you know, shocking for some, but he said there's no way it came from Persia or Greece or Rome. Because those ideals didn't exist in those cultures. 
He said, there's no way it came from the 18th century enlightenment, which is, I know what a lot of sort of happy secularists say today, but he said, there's no way that can be true because these ideals were firmly embedded in the Western culture centuries before the enlightenment. They can only have come, he says, from Jesus Christ, the New Testament and the history of the church. So uh, his book is a 600-page case for how the values of equality and human rights and so on uh, came to dominate even secular Western culture. So if you want the 600-page version, there it is. If you want the just one-hour version with me, you can have to wait till June when the pod uh, interview uh, comes out. But in short, he says that between the year 500 and 1500, our Western culture was utterly reshaped by this. More specifically, he says, utterly reshaped by this bit. The Gospels and the letters of Paul. And so, of course, I asked him in the interview, what prevents you from you know, becoming a Christian yourself? His answer was delightful and intriguing, but you'll have to wait for the pod. <laughs> or the question time. In the next three talks, I want to explore the ways that this story has changed everything. Not just for culture, though I'll do a little bit of that, but also in people's personal lives. And I want to approach this by examining the opening two chapters of the earliest of our four biographies of Jesus, the Gospel of Mark. And we've just uh, heard the opening chapter. And I use the word biography deliberately because here is my first point. Christianity has reshaped the way we, at least in the West, even think about what religion is. Christianity is biographical. Biographical. What I mean is it's fundamentally about trusting the life story of a person. And it hits us from the opening line of the passage just read to us. The beginning of the good news, or gospel, about Jesus, the Messiah, and so on. Mark tells us that the Christian good news is a life story. And as this book of Mark uh, continues on in its uh, various uh, chapters... Uh, this point is borne out. It's singularly focused on the deeds and the words of one individual. Here's the point. The founding documents of Christianity are biographies. Four in a row. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's uh, Professor Richard Borkham of Cambridge, one of the leading experts in the field. If you think, how would a contemporary reader of the Gospels, how would one of the first readers of the Gospels have thought of it? What sort of literature would they have thought it was? Um, I think the, the answer that is actually what very widespread uh, among scholars now is that they would have seen them as biographies. Um, we need to be a bit careful with that because it's biography in the ancient sense of a biography, uh, not necessarily much like the kind of biographies that people write today. So there are things that you wouldn't expect to get in an ancient biography uh, that you might expect in, in, in a modern one, such as an interest in psychology, which is very typical modern. You don't get much of probing into a person's inner development and so on in ancient biography. Um, but people would have seen the Gospels, I think, as an ancient biography in the sense of an account of the life um, of some prominent figure. There were biographies of all kinds of figures, generals, politicians, artists, uh, writers, philosophers, and so forth. And they would have seen this, I think, as a, 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 a biography of, of Jesus. And the importance of that, of course, is they would expect this to be a, a record of what happened. Um, they would be looking for historical information. They would not have expected it to be mere legend or an entertaining bit of fiction or other kinds of literature that you could be reading. Um, the Gospels look like a biography. That is, they look like um, historical writing of a particular kind. And we are so used to this 
understanding of Christian scripture that we miss how weird it is in world history. That Christian scripture is founded on biographies. No other world religion has biographies as their founding scripture. It's very, very striking. Um, And of course, uh, this is because no other world religion is as focused on its founder as Christianity is. This is why it's called Christianity, by the way. Um, Unlike, say, Hinduism. Uh, Hindus don't call Hinduism Hinduism. That was just a, a British word. They call it Sanatana Dharma, which means eternal wisdom. And it's not focused on any individual. It's about the uh, wisdom passed on to the first uh, human in a mythical time, and then this tradition has been passed down. Or think of uh, Islam. This word Islam means submission. Submission to God, not to Muhammad. And if you know anything about Islam, Muhammad said that the Christian devotion to the person of Jesus is a blasphemy. Buddhism you might think, gets its word from a man called the Buddha, but that's not actually how it works. Uh, Buddha just means enlightened, right? And uh, the the reason Buddhism is called Buddhism is because every Buddhist hopes for enlightenment. It isn't about devotion to the Buddha, but here is Christianity beginning and ending with Jesus. The good news of Christianity is all about a person. And the reason... This is worth emphasizing, I think particularly in our time and place, if you don't mind my saying, is that in Australia, and particularly the North Shore, there is a watered-down version of Christianity. And I say this as a, a, you know, insider, right? I was born in Mossman, I moved all the way to Roseville, and now I ventured as far as Kalara. Okay, so this is, this is my home turf, and, and it just seems that there's, there's this watered-down version of Christianity that basically says... Respecting some vague concept of the Almighty and adding a little bit of the ethics of Jesus into your life, love your enemy, do unto others and all that, is pretty much what Christianity is. And I just want to offer this little reminder that weirdly among the faiths, Christianity entails faith or trust in a biography, a particular life story with its teaching, healing, death, and resurrection. Christianity is biographical. It is therefore, secondly, historical. Historical. Now, please um, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I don't mean Christianity is true and the others aren't. I wouldn't be so impolite. I mean, Christianity purports to be true in an entirely different way from the way Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam purport to be true. Uh, Hinduism, as I mentioned a moment ago, focuses on the eternal wisdom from the dawn of time that's been passed down as a mighty tradition. Buddhism focuses on the insights of Siddhartha Gautama at the moment of his enlightenment, and Islam focuses on the very words that the angel Gabriel is said to have dictated to the Prophet Muhammad about the commands of how to live life, uh, the laws that should be enacted in society, and so on. There is in these traditions loads of profound insight, ritual, and law, but almost no historical events. Whereas in the case of Christianity, the focus isn't on rituals or insights or laws. The focus is on events in time and space. A real teacher, whose words and debates with certain groups, historians today can locate precisely in Jesus' time and region. A healer, whose deeds were reported by non-Christian sources from the ancient world, not just Christian ones. A saviour, who didn't die in like mythical time, in a land far, far away, or Middle Earth, No, but who was crucified by the fifth governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, whose dates we know precisely. And even the resurrection is a topic of massive secular discussion today. 
I know that may surprise some people, but it is a big discussion in secular history because, weirdly, we have the kind of evidence a resurrection would leave behind and much more evidence pointing in that direction than we would ever expect if it were just made up. What I'm saying is Christianity is a kind of newsflash, breaking news from the second quarter of the first century. And ancient readers will have spotted this from the opening line of the gospel. The beginning of the good news, this word is euangelion, gospel, about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, what we miss is that we think of the word gospel, euangelion, as a religious word. Right? You only ever hear the word gospel today as like gospel music, or we say something is gospel truth, or the four gospels, starting the New Testament. But ancient hearers of the word gospel didn't think of it as a religious term at all. It was a media term. It basically translates as breaking news about real events in time and space. And I don't really mean to turn this into a history lesson, although that's not so bad. Here are three fun examples from the ancient world of this same word, gospel, used. Uh, announcing a new emperor. And quicker than thought, the good news of the new emperor spread in the east. Here's one announcing a military victory. Two of the archers hurried to Sparta, bringing the good news, gospel, uh, that the enemy had been captured. And here's a delightful comedic example from a play by Aristophanes, an ancient Greek play. A butcher rushes into the war cabinet of the city council and says, councillors, I bring you good news. Never have anchovies been cheaper at the market. By telling us in the opening line that this is the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Mark was setting his whole message not in the category of legend or myth, not even in the category of religion, but in the category of a newsflash, of breaking news about real events that actually happened when Tiberius was emperor, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, when Herod Antipas was the ruler of Galilee, all figures that are mentioned in the gospel and we know from history. And the mention in the second paragraph of Mark's gospel of John the Baptist also locates us in real history. Let me remind you of that text. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Now, we think of the Baptist as just a, a weird desert figure from Christian scripture. But first century people knew him to be one of the most influential reformers in the region and period. Here is a non-Christian, secular reference from the first century to this same figure. John, surnamed the baptizer, had exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, to practice justice toward their fellow fellows and piety towards God, and so doing to join in baptism. The crowds were aroused to the highest degree by his speeches, and Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, became alarmed. Eloquence that had so great an effect on mankind might lead to some form of sedition, for it looked as if they would be guided by John in everything that they did. Herod decided, therefore, that it would be much better to strike first and be rid of him before his work led to an uprising. So, John was brought in chains to Machaerus, Herod's stronghold. Now, here's the thing. Mark dates the first preaching of Jesus 
to this year when John the Baptist was arrested and put in prison. As we see in this paragraph from Mark, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And my point is, every ancient reader will have known that the Gospel of Mark isn't legend. It isn't even, first of all, religion. It is history. A real life, locatable, dateable. And the reason that's worth knowing is that Christian faith is not a leap in the dark. There's no such thing as blind faith in the Christian faith. It is reasoned trust in real, though remarkable, events. Christianity is biographical, centered on a person. It is historical. Thirdly, it is humble. What do I mean? I mean, this message will have struck the first readers and hearers as written by and for the lowly, not by or for elites. There is um, a reasonable suspicion that modern historians have when reading ancient sources. We use the phrase, you know, the winners get to write the history, and that is very true. And so when we come across Tacitus or Suetonius or even Josephus, we know we are reading elite literature by powerful people. And here's the fear the historian has to think through. This isn't representative. We're hearing just a tiny proportion. This does not represent, uh, you know, real life from the ancient world, and we need to adjust for that. And, and secondly, we worry that e these sources are themselves an act of power, a way of maintaining the status quo. Can that be said? of the New Testament. Not for a second. Not for a second. The first thing people will have known in ancient times, if, if not in modern times, when they read the opening line of Mark's gospel, Ake tu euangeliu Jesu Christu, is, this is common Greek. This is not the Greek of the Iliad. This is not the Greek of Plutarch's great biographies. This is, the, this is the Greek of the marketplace, of the street. This is the Greek you order your lamb souvlaki with, not one that you write a great document in. It's common Greek. In fact, that is technically what we call it. We call it Koine Greek. Common Greek. And anyone who set an eye on the manuscripts of Mark's gospel from the first 300 years will have spotted these weren't even copied out by elites. These were copied out by amateurs. Uh, this, by the way, uh, is a newly discovered, three years ago, newly discovered front page of Mark's Gospel. Uh, this, this is our very passage in a new manuscript, um, stored safely in a vault in Oxford. Next time you're there, go and play with it. It's true by the time you get to 400 and 500 years the, the copies suddenly become beautifully neat. But this, this is classic. I, I can even write this well in Greek. It's amateur. Now, why is that worth knowing? I know it sounds like I'm just giving you, you know, nerdy information, maybe elite information about the Gospels. No way. My point is the opposite. Everyone knew that this was a history from below. It's not a history from above. This is not the winners. This is the underdogs. The Gospels provide a unique historical insight into ordinary life. And you don't have to just uh, take my word for it. Here's Theresa Morgan, professor of Greco-Roman history at Oxford University. A lot of the people who would have been listening to early Christian writings would have been much poorer than that. So this really is the community literature of very ordinary people. And as such, it's actually a priceless, I mean, aside from its religious value, it's a priceless document in social history of the lives of 
a very a community of really pretty ordinary people in the early Roman Empire of a kind that we have almost no parallel for. I mean, it's a very rare corpus of documents just for a social historian. I know that the church has been a bully in the centuries that followed. Okay, totally. But the texts themselves, the last thing on their mind is manipulation, power. They're humble. The biography of Jesus might be set in the time of elites like Pontius Pilate and Emperor Tiberius and Herod Antipas, but it's not written about them and it's not in the first instance even for them. It is humble. The heroes of our text are desert preachers like John the Baptist, martyred by the elites. Or Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, who who were fishermen, who lived by the seasons and worked with their hands. Galilean women like Salome and the multiple Marys we meet in the Gospels, who traveled with Jesus all the way to his shocking end on a cross. And of course, the the main hero, if I can put it like this, of our story is a humble Galilean teacher who healed people, who handed out forgiveness to people like it was his to offer, who welcomed the lowly, and in the end was arrested by Jerusalem elites and put up on a cross by the Roman governor. It's humble. It's true that the claim at the heart of the story is about the kingdom of God. Yeah, they're the first words of Jesus. God proving himself king over all things. God making all things well. More about the kingdom of God in a couple of weeks, but this just makes it more remarkable, doesn't it? God achieves his purposes for the world from below. Not like a bully from above. Through a humble message written in a humble language about a humble Lord who died for you. As Jesus himself puts it right near the end of his life, Mark 10. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even I, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. All of which leads to my final point. Christianity is personal. Uh, These opening words uh, from the lips of Jesus in Mark's gospel are effectively a personal summons. What does Jesus say? The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Yeah, so that's got a global sense, but, but the response is repent and believe. That's, that's what he's asking of us. Now, I know the word repent is a sort of very geeky religious piece of jargon. Some people think of it as like the Christian swear word. You know, the sort of thing a preacher would say while thumping the pulpit. Repent! But actually, it's a lovely word, metanoia. It just means change mind. Change mind. And believe is just the word faith or trust. Change mind, trust. By definition, this is about the inner life. Not about external rituals. Not about external laws. And of course, throughout the Gospel of Mark... Time and time again, Jesus uh, addresses individuals and asks them personally to trust him. I mean, the very next lines in our passage are where he asks Simon, whom we call Peter, and his brother Andrew, come follow me. Personal summons. And that's exactly what they did. And the lines immediately after that are where James and John, more fishermen, are called by Jesus and they drop everything and follow him, personal summons. And in the uh, next two weeks, we're going to zero in on two individuals who met Jesus and their lives utterly changed. For now, 
my point is, Christianity is personal. And we are so used to that in the West that we miss how unusual it is in the history of ideas. Christianity is not public ritual. As weird as it sounds to our ears, most ancient religion was mainly ritualistic and performative. Um, Ancient people thought of religion the way we think of Anzac Day. They don't think of it first and foremost about what is your inner feeling about the Anzacs. So long as you respect the tradition, so long as you show respect to the festival, to the ritual, that's, that's what's expected. Christianity gave us a religion of the heart where ritual hardly matters compared to personal trust in Jesus. The other thing to know is that religion has, through history, been largely legislative, legal, law, law uh, oriented. Now, let, let me be sensitive in saying this, because I mean no disrespect to Islam. I used to teach Islam in the history department at Macquarie Uni. I've grown to understand it and deeply respect it. And there are personal forms of Islam. We call it Sufism, right? But it's a tiny minority of Muslims. Islam is, first and foremost, and from the beginning, a legislative program. And and this is why Muslims date their calendar, not to the birth or the death of Muhammad, you know, like BC 80 or whatever. Um, They date it to the year Muhammad first legislated Islam in Medina. That's actually year one in the Muslim calendar. For our Muslim friends, this is not the year 2021. It's 1442. Now, I'm sure you're you're thinking immediately, hang on, haven't there been legislative versions of Christianity? (laughs) Oh, yeah. And highly ritualistic versions of Christianity. Yes. But, friends, in the founding documents and in the founding centuries, there's very little ritual and there is no legislative agenda. Because Christianity is first and foremost a personal challenge where Jesus Christ calls us by name. Simon. Salome. John. You. To change our minds and trust him. Christianity is biographical. It's really focused on a person. It's historical. It's not about legendary myths. It's humble. It's not shoving anything on you. It's come to you from below. And yes, it is personal. The inner life matters more in Christianity than anything external. Well, you may have seen the news that uh, Anglicans elected a new archbishop two weeks ago, Kanishka Rafal. And um, he was interviewed on Richard Glover's program, the Drive program, just this week. Some of you may have heard it. And Richard Glover asked Kanishka, uh, who was a former Buddhist, um, a question that gave Kanishka the opportunity to say basically what I've said about the historical and personal dimensions of Christianity, but he, but he puts it much simpler and, and briefer. So let me give the last word to the incoming Archbishop. Something happened to you at university, though, didn't it? You, uh, somebody, uh, I don't know quite how it happened, but someone flung you a copy of the Gospel of John. <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as abrupt as that. Um, actually, he was a good friend, uh, someone I'd known from high school. Uh, my... My background, of course, is Sri Lankan, and so we were raised Buddhist in Australia, which was an a, a unusual kind of experience, I guess. Um, uh, you know, uh, Sydney in the 70s was uh, a, a little quieter and a, a lot less multicultural, <laughs> and so I was a bit of a novelty wherever I went. But um, in my third year at university, I 
uh, really decided that I needed to do a kind of adult engagement with my faith of Buddhism. And uh, um, so I spent the year really reading Buddhism. And I think maybe bolstered by my new confidence, I began to engage my uh, Christian friends uh, about their faith. And that resulted in one of those friends giving me um, the Gospel of John, uh, which I undertook to read. What happened when you read it? <laughs> well, uh, um, my life changed, Richard. That, that's what happened in short. Um, I, uh, having, read, having spent the year reading Buddhist scriptures, I was very struck by how different uh, the Gospel of John was. It was transparently historical, uh, clearly talking about a, uh, a particular man and a particular place at a particular time. And the person of Jesus just emerged from the pages with uh, vitality and vibrancy and he was unusual. He wasn't like the Buddha. Um, he had friends and enemies. He kind of uh, got into verbal skirmishes and worse in the end. And uh, so I found his character intriguing and provocative and compelling. Um, and uh, ultimately, of course, I, uh, I decided I was for him. Ultimately, I decided I was for him. That, that's what being a Christian feels like. That is the story that changes everything in culture, but also and especially for individuals personally. Lord, will you please help us wherever we find ourselves in our own experience of faith or doubt? to have clarity of mind, to think through these things for ourselves, approach them as grown-ups, and ultimately I pray that everyone in the building would come to see personally what Kanishka saw, how compelling is Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Thank you, John. Uh, we do have some time for questions. Uh, if you'd like to text questions to the mobile number, I'll read them out for you. There's plenty here to get us started. Right. You'll be unsurprised by the first question. What is Tom Holland's answer? And then with a oh, please yeah. emoji. <laughs> <laughs> well, we included his whole answer in, in, in the pod, which you'll hear in a few weeks, uh, undeceptions. Um, he basically said he's a work in progress. He said, having to go back to these sources and realise that they really did shape our world and shape what he had always thought as a good secularist, made him think, well, um, what would it mean if this weren't true? What, what, what ethics would rationally follow in a world in which human beings just evolved by accident? Do human rights and equality and charity emerge from that narrative? And so he just feels very pressed by it. In fact, he said to me, you know, because uh, I interviewed him just before Easter, the Easter week, and he said, you know what, probably next week in Easter, I I'll believe this. And then he goes, and then the next week I probably won't. <laughs> oh, I look forward to listening to that. Given that the Gospels are biographical, is there a danger that we overanalyze every word rather than focusing on the themes and emphasis contained in the writings? So I guess the question is, is there a danger in treating them only as biography? Well, I think if you treat them as biographies, you end up treating them correctly in the end because if you read it simply as a historical biography, the person you meet at the center won't allow you to think of him just as a normal historical life. Um, so you read it like it's a real biography, because that's, that's its literary genre, but the person you meet there is like no other biography you've ever come across, and so you are thrown to a much larger perspective. So the, the, the intention behind the question is absolutely correct, but, but you can just enter in, especially if you're a doubter, just enter in reading it like an ancient biography, and you'll find Jesus there. Do what, do what he did to Kanishka. <laughs> Grab hold of him, and uh, it changed everything. Great, thanks. Um, in your opening statement, you mentioned that Western values are formed or came from Christians. Yep. Uh, to what extent are these values 
um, the values of the early Christians um, still present in the Western world? Have they been watered down? Are we losing them? Well, they're, they're still very present. I mean, Tom Holland's argument is his intellectual set in Britain still assume that humility is a virtue, charity should be available for all, there should be a special care for the vulnerable, uh, human rights, human dignity applies to every human being regardless of capacity. And so these are kind of the secular values now. They, they don't belong to the church. But, but the point is that they've been given to the West because of Christ, ultimately, but the influence of Christianity. Um, and, and I asked Tom in the interview... Um, so as, as our culture secularizes more and more and Christianity, you know, so the story goes, is shrinking in terms of church attendance, uh, what does the future hold? And he, and he said, it's too early to tell, but, but that is the big question Westerners have to face. Can you sustain charity, equality, humility, human rights where there's no God there's just the accident of evolution. And he actually goes further. He, he said the only experiment in Western history of completely reversing the ethics of Christianity is Nazism. He said in the sweep of 2,000 years, that's the only time people have like, deliberately tried to pursue the opposite ethic. Yeah, I've heard him speak about that too. And he said the church needs to realize the story that they have. Yeah. Uh, they need to be expert in their own story. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah. he, says, he says the cross, the crucifixion, is really the, the ultimate thing that changed the world. Mm. It's, it's when humans came to believe the most important event in world history was someone giving their life away, the ultimate giving himself for us. So that so upended how Greeks and Romans thought about what was the good. And, and he, I said to him, you talk about the cross better than half the Christian preachers I know. And he, and he says exactly that, that um, Christians don't know what, what they've got. John, if secular academia is so clear on the historical Jesus, why are the historical facts considered controversial or at least only vaguely known in popular Western culture? Oh, well, two, two reasons. One, hardly anything really good in academia trickles down. Um, and two, um, academic, um, academic uh, like insight, intellectual insight, you know, in the end, isn't the reason people take up or drop these things. So, you know, the, the thing is, I could introduce you to secular scholars who think basically the whole story of Jesus is, is true, including that there was an empty tomb found, including that people really thought they saw Jesus alive, right? but who aren't Christians. And it doesn't change their life. And, and I think the lesson there is, evidence won't change your life. We, we are not just brains in a vat. We are social creatures, we are emotional creatures, we are psychological creatures, and all of this is playing a part in why people resist Christianity. Uh, I, I honestly think that um, the, the so-called demise of Christianity in, say, Australia has zero to do with the intellect, has zero to do with the lack of evidence. It's entirely a psychological and sociological phenomenon. Well, this is a good follow-up question, and I think it might need to be our last, although I'm tempted just to keep reading them out. Um, if we cognitively reason like this, and the evidence is so strong, why, like Holland, is it so hard to believe? Psychological and sociological reasons. When, you know, when you are... Um, bombarded um, in the media, uh, when you live in a sort of social media environment or a work environment where, the, where God is like pushed to the side and, and like talking about Christianity is like, oh, we, we don't discuss that here, you know. Um, when that's over and over, drip, 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 that has the effect of dulling any innate sense we might have that there's something to this. And so we have a sneaking suspicion that there might be something to it. But, but it's like we, look at, we live in a world where this is pushed to the side and so psychologically we go, well, 
you know, maybe, maybe I'm the only one who's really thinking seriously about this. And, and, and that, that tamps down the sort of hunches that we have about this. It's psychological. So I would just say, you know, pick up a gospel, read it, ask all the intellectual questions, but be aware intellect won't decide it. Well, with that in mind, um, before you go, can I just recommend to you then The Life of Jesus, John, which you're going to run yourself mm -hmm. um, beginning of June, where you can actually go through a gospel and ask questions um, and engage your mind, heart and soul. Do you, you've written the course and you're leading yeah. it. Do you want to just give yeah, us a quick insight? It's really insight? creepy because it's actually based on a documentary that I also appear in. <laughs> um, so it's like you get two of me. And I, I think that's a disadvantage, actually. <laughs> Because usually this course is run by churches where I don't appear as well, and, and people feel free to disagree with the guy on the screen. Um, so it's, we're going to have to navigate that together. Um, sorry, your question was... How would you describe the course? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, well, you, we go through uh, one of the other Gospels, Luke. So in three weeks, you actually read Luke's Gospel. Very easy to do. Um, and we quiz, you know, what are the main themes here? Uh, what can you learn about the Christian faith? by the thing every Christian variety agrees on, Jesus, right? So it's not Anglican Christianity, it's not Baptist Christianity, it's not Catholic Christianity, because all of the brands of Christianity agree on the person, Jesus, in the Gospels. So sticking close to him is really a valuable way, as a modern, to think through what is the heart and soul of the Christian faith. Yeah, excellent. Well, there's details there, but also in the news and on the website, so I commend that to you. Uh, there were a ton of questions. Some of them I think will be answered over the next couple of weeks. Um, others you might find answers to in that course, but I'll... I'll a very good morning. Please be seated. It's lovely to be with you again. My name is Stuart Holman. I'm part of the ministry team here at St Andrews Roseville. Isn't it great to be able to sing again without masks to... Uh, really enjoy praise and worship together. So uh, thank you to our band for that. Today we uh, continue uh, the second in our series of the story that changes everything. Uh, we're glad that uh, the Reverend John Dixon is with us again this morning and uh, we look forward to exploring a little further this uh, story, this narrative that is, and let's see if we can remember this from last week, right, biographical, historical, humble and personal. I was reflecting on those things during the week, thinking how, isn't it great the way that this, in fact, uh, these, these characteristics tell us something of the God who actually addresses us in this narrative, uh, that God enters into life biographically, in history, actual time and space, part of our world, in humility, surprisingly, that God should be clothed as a human being in great, such humility and personally to actually address each one of us. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to our time this morning. As we did last week, there is the opportunity for you to text in your questions. The number's up on the screen. It'll appear again uh, through the service. But uh, as uh, you hear uh, what is being spoken, you're, you're so free to interact, ask questions, and after John speaks, then I'll be up to, uh, to address those questions with John. Uh, so for now, we are to have the Bible read for us, I believe. And Emily's going to do that for us. So thank you very much, Emily. Good morning. The Bible reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 2. Mark, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralysed man, carried by the four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Uh, if you were here last week, you'll know that I mentioned uh, this man, Tom Holland. Uh, he is probably the world's biggest selling history writer with uh, too many books uh, to his name. Um, but his uh, latest book is this one, uh, Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. Now, the interesting thing is, he is not a Christian, uh, but he argues that Christianity gave the Western world its values of charity and equality and human rights. And I said all that uh, last week, but right on cue this week, he exploded Twitter uh, by tweeting a response to something atheist Richard Dawkins had said on the BBC questioning human equality, raising the question of whether it's really just a metaphysical concept rather than a rational scientific one. And Tom Holland chimed in with this. The assumption that all human life is of equal value is, as Richard Dawkins intimates, a theological one. As Nietzsche, the great uh, 19th century atheist, long ago recognised when one gives up the Christian faith, one pulls the right to Christian morality out from under one's feet. And Twitter exploded, which is, you know, default mode. Uh, but his point wasn't that atheists can't be moral, not that atheists can't believe in equality, of course not. Um, his point uh, in a lot of his writings, especially a cheeky thing like this, is that the very reason so many unbelievers today, including him, still believe that every human being is equal is because of what he calls the dominion of Christ in the Western world. That is the overwhelming way in which this story changed Western culture. Uh, Holland is saying in his intellectual setting sort of what I'm saying in this uh, short three-week series. This story changes everything. And uh, to recap what I said last week, uh, Stu did a good job of uh, remembering uh, that I made the point, just broad points about Christianity from Mark chapter 1, that Christianity is uniquely biographical. No other religion has biographies as the founding texts. Christianity has four of them in a row, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I made the point that Christianity is historical. It doesn't concern dreams and visions and philosophical insights or rituals. It's about real events in time and space that we can, to a large degree, verify. And I said it is humble. It's clear that these texts were written by and for the lowly, not by elites, and if you know anything about history, that is rare because our historical texts tend to be written by the winners. These texts, not so much. And they concern a story that is about the humble Lord who gave himself for us. And fourthly, I made the point that 
Christianity is personal. That is, its main business is not the main business of the other religions. Uh, good, respectable religions focus on ritual and law. And Christianity doesn't. Christianity focuses on a personal, heartfelt, inner trust in a person, Jesus Christ. Uh, today, I want to leave these four thoughts sort of hovering in the background. We're never really going to be very far away from them in this series. But I want to zero in on one story from the Gospels in chapter 2 of Mark, the one just read to us. Uh, Jesus' interaction with an individual. And um, I'm really hoping I'm able to convey something of my own experience as I read and reread this passage in preparing for this talk. I'm not always confident I can do that, but studying this passage was like drawing water from an ever-deepening well. I'd, I'd dig a little and there'd be some lovely water and then I'd notice a little further, I'd dig a little further and even better water and dig a little further and it's even better water and, and so on. This text begins by introducing us to a simple, if famous, teacher. But in the end, we find ourselves face to face with God. So let's begin in safe territory, the teacher. The opening paragraph uh, is, is plausible. It's not gonna make anyone uncomfortable, I'm sure. Uh, it's basically just Jesus, the famous teacher who came back to Capernaum and uh, people gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Everything about the scene is plausible, including the, the, the city. Um, Capernaum is a real place on the map. You can go there and walk through the remains of the first century streets. And I know I have taken several of you. I'm looking at, yes, yes, Ness. Ness has been to Capernaum. Ness has been to Capernaum. Dick and Jenny. Who else have I taken there? John. Um, it's a real place. And you're looking at houses that stood when Jesus was there in one of these houses. It's a real place in the real world. We, we are not in Middle Earth. We are squarely in the Middle East. Jesus' preaching is also entirely plausible, and I know for some of us, it's the only plausible thing, and it would be just fine if I stopped here. Jesus, a famous teacher. Uh, even Albert Einstein, the smartest man in the room, every room, uh, who, who was never gushing about religion, nonetheless said this about Jesus the teacher. I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. No one can deny the fact that Jesus existed, nor that his sayings are beautiful. But you know, ancient non-Christian sources from the first century say the same thing non-Christian sources. Here is the Jewish aristocrat, Flavius Josephus. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was one who wrought surprising feats, hold that in your memory, and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. Now that's exactly what we find in our gospel texts. That Jesus is preaching and people flock to him in such numbers that there is no room left. But just when this feels like it might be a nice, safe story about the, the teacher that we've all grown to love and respect, we dig a little further and it gets more confronting. We come face to face with a healer. We're told that some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. By digging through and lowering the man, uh, lowering the mat the man was lying on. 
And Jesus later says, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. Okay, there are a couple of really implausible things here. Uh, Firstly, what on earth is this business of carrying a paralysed man and somehow, what, scaling the outside of the wall with the man over their shoulder, ripping open the, the wood and the tiles? I mean, did they have a saw with them? It just seems implausible. Unless you lived in first century Capernaum or... Zippori or Bethsaida or whatever, because everyone knew it was very common, especially in big houses, to have an external staircase precisely to repair the roof because they hadn't quite worked out how to make roofs not fall in. Um, This is entirely mechanically plausible. There is nothing implausible uh, about doing this to a first century house. Uh, to To be sure, it's impolite, okay? But, but these friends of this paralysed man, they're not worrying about first century etiquette. They'll do anything to help their friend. So busting a few bits of the roof open, no problem. But of course it's the healing that's the most implausible thing. So what do we say about that? Well, this deserves uh, three hours, which is precisely what I give at Sydney Uni when I give the lecture on Jesus as healer. But let me just say two very quick things in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Firstly, we have exactly the kind of evidence we would expect if Jesus really did perform such healings. From a historical point of view, that is undoubted. And experts who are not Christians, who study the life of Jesus, will agree with everything I am saying. Because we have three separate sources from within 20 years of Jesus. And we have eight separate sources, these are sources not copied from one another, referring to Jesus' miracle working within 60 years. And the importance of that is it's living memory. There are still people alive 60 years after Jesus. We even have non-Christian reference uh, to Jesus, uh, the one I mentioned a moment ago from Flavius Josephus, about this time they lived Jesus, a wise man. He was one who wrought surprising feats. Um, this is a neutral way of saying, I don't know what they were. The, the Greek language that he uses there is actually paradoxa, erga. Paradoxa means weird, erga, deeds. Uh, par- he's not committing t- to know whether they were miracles, but they were, they were baffling deeds. But here's the thing. Compare this to another reputed healer from the same time and place. Uh, Hanina, you may have never heard of Hanina, but he was a very famous rabbi around the time of Jesus. We have one source about him praying for a sick person and them getting well. One source, and it was written 130 years after Hanina's death. What does a historian do with that? No one was alive when that source was written. We don't know what to do, maybe he had a reputation. But everyone knows what to do with three sources within 20 years and eight sources within 60 years. It's exactly the kind of evidence the miracle working of Jesus would leave behind. And it's a conclusion we can reach for no other figure from antiquity. It is just a fact. We have exactly the kind of evidence we would expect if Jesus really did perform such healings. The second thing that's uh, worth saying is that The only issue remaining is whether you reckon there is a creator behind the laws of nature. That's really the issue. See, if you don't think there's a mind that is responsible for the elegant mathematical laws which describe all the actions of the universe, if you don't think there's a mind behind that that has made that possible, then, of course, no amount of evidence can convince you. If it's just the laws of nature and nothing but... Yeah, your background belief is, is going to dismiss every form of evidence. But if, like the vast majority of humans, you think there probably is a mind behind the laws of nature, then obviously the mind could work in and through and beyond the laws to do a miracle. The only question is, do we have the kind of evidence such a thing would leave behind? And I put it to you, in one case we do. One case. 
the case of Jesus. Uh, but Mark doesn't leave it there, and nor should I. There's a third layer. Beneath the teacher, beneath the healer, we are then introduced to the saviour who can forgive sins. Mark 2.5, when Jesus saw their faith, the paralysed man and his buddies, he said to the paralysed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, we are not told what the paralysed man and his friends thought at that moment, right? You might speculate they were temporarily disappointed. Right? They didn't come here for a spiritual forgiveness. They came here for something rather more practical, okay? The mat and the ropes and the roof gave that away. We're not told what they thought. We are, look, told what the religious authorities thought about this. Verse 6 makes clear. Now, some of the teachers of the law, these are the religious authorities, were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? See, no human being can step in and say, your sins are forgiven, because sins, by definition, are the things we do to offend the Almighty. Right? So, um, if I steal your wallet... And Stu says, I forgive you, John. You're going to go, foul. <laughs> what authority does he have? This is the question. Forgiveness of sins is God's business. And in the view of the religious authorities, this must be mere talk, cheap talk, blasphemous talk, but easy talk. And that's why Jesus responds like he does in verse 9, where he says, which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. See, his critics reckon it's easy talk to say your sins are forgiven because it's invisible. You don't start glowing or anything like that. It's cheap talk. So, Jesus uses this moment to prove that he can do the invisible thing of forgiving sins by doing the visible and verifiable thing of healing this paralyzed man and so we get but I want you to know that the son of man more about that weird title in a moment has authority on earth to forgive sins so he said to the man I tell you get up take your mat and go home he got up took his mat and walked out so here is the most extraordinary thing about Christianity. Not that Jesus was a famous teacher, not even that we have the kind of evidence a healer would leave behind. The most extraordinary thing is that I get to wake up each morning knowing that my sins are forgiven. That changes everything. Now, I know our culture balks at even the idea of sin. Right? I mean, we've got this secular mantra, ma mantra that says, um, we're basically good, aren't we? And we're basically getting better, aren't we? I've said before from this pulpit, <laughs> I reckon that is just about the most oppressive doctrine humanity has come up with. How, how could I believe that I am good through and through and only getting better, when I live with myself. And, and the counter evidence I get by about 9 a.m. every day would just be so oppressive and I'd have to go in, back into this mantra, no, 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 despite all evidence, I'm good through and through and I'm only getting better. Frankly, we hardly live up to our own values, let alone the values of the Almighty. But here is the unique gift of the Christian faith to the world. Christ offers us forgiveness of sins, free of charge. And let's be clear, it is free. Look at the text closely, just so you know I'm not making this up. 
Look at verse 5. It says, when Jesus saw their, what? Faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Soak that up. It's a theme weaving its way through the whole of Mark's gospel. Not when Jesus saw their commitment, not when he saw their ingenuity, not when he saw their zeal, not even when he saw their love. When he saw their trust. This word faith just means trust. When he saw their trust, he said, your sins are forgiven. Friends, this is unique. And, and I know it's become sort of common sense. You know, even, even the good sort of secular humanist, humanist today thinks, well, if there is a God, which of course there isn't, but if there is, he'd be so magnanimous, he'd be into forgiving people's sins, right? We, but that is Christianity's influence on our culture. Because the other religions of the world are far more logical in saying, no, it is your effort that wins reward. Hinduism fam famously has these three paths of salvation. Jnana, which is the path of asceticism. Karma, which is the way of deeds. Bhakti, which is the way of devotion. But they have this in common. It is about your diligence in the path. The Buddha was the same in one of the most famous texts of Buddhism, the Dhammapada. He said, oneself indeed is patron of oneself. Who else indeed could be one's patron? I can almost hear Frank Sinatra singing, I did it my way. <laughs> By oneself is wrong done. By oneself is one defiled. By oneself wrong is not done. By oneself surely one is cleansed. One cannot purify another. Purity and impurity are in oneself alone. And Islam teaches roughly the same thing, that your good deeds can undo your sins if you do enough. Here's the Quran in section 2, 271. To give alms publicly is commendable, but to keep it secret and give it to the poor is better for you and will atone for some of your sins. I could quote text upon text upon text Making the same point, um, the religions of the world are more logical than Christianity at this point. Only effort earns reward. The scandal of Christianity is that it says, no, no, it's by trust, by faith, that God freely forgives sins. And actually, there's a deeper scandal than that. I say forgiveness is free, but actually all I mean is free to you and me. Because Jesus taught that it was immensely costly to him. We don't atone for our sins through deeds. Toward the end of Mark's gospel, he said these words. Whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all, for even I, the son of man, there's that creepy title again, did not come to be served but to serve, and look at this, and to give my life as a ransom for many. We can't remove our guilt by pretending we're good through and through or by self-help or trying harder or even religion. The way is faith. So taught the teacher. So proved the healer. And of course the saviour died to make it a reality. So that you and I can wake up each morning almost having these words ring in our ears. Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. And I just tell you personally, to be able to live out of that assurance is the animating principle of my life. So Mark introduces us to the teacher, only to reveal beneath that the healer and beneath that the saviour. 
uh, but there is another layer, the strangest and most confronting of all. God. Hmm. God. Mark has been preparing us for this ever since the opening paragraph of his gospel. Um, Last week, I felt I didn't have time to do what I probably should have done and show that, that Mark deliberately sets up this theme that I'm now about to unpack. And he does it by right at the very front of his gospel, quoting an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah about someone preparing the way for the Lord. And in the prophecy in the Old Testament, the Lord is God and the preparer is some kind of prophet. Okay? The way Mark designs the introduction is that John the Baptist is the preparer and Jesus is the one prepared for. And like just in the space of four paragraphs in Mark chapter 1, the reader is going, hang on, is, is Mark saying Jesus is the Lord showing up? And so when we come to our story in the very next chapter, we are primed. We are primed. Jesus claims to do something everyone knew only God can possibly do. Forgive sins. And the religious authorities are absolutely right there in verse 7. Why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At which point Jesus could surely have said, Oh, no, no, I didn't mean to imply that. Oh. Instead, what does he do? He amps it up by going and proving that he can forgive sins, but actually then using a title no human being would dare use. In verse 10, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Son of Man might not mean much to us all these years later, but everyone in the audience knew exactly what it was. It only occurs once in the Old Testament, And it appears in a vision in Daniel chapter 7. And the vision is bizarre, but the key bit is this. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a, there it is, son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven, which is usually a description of God. He, the son of man, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Now here's the thing, in a vision in the Old Testament we get this mysterious son of man who somehow is worthy of the thing that only God is worthy of, that is worship by all people. And that's the title Jesus uses of himself at the very moment he does what only God can do. Forgive sins. I think most Westerners sort of miss the scandal of this. I mean, even sort of, you know, like an educated, secular thinker sort of is used to the idea, you know, those Christians and their God in the flesh, you know, God incarnate in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) The ancient Jews saw the scandal much better than we do because we're now used to it. And our Muslim friends also see the scandal with much greater clarity than we do. Here's what the Quran says about this idea I'm preaching on. Section 5. They do blaspheme who say God is Christ, the son of Mary. If they desist not from their word of blasphemy, verily a grievous penalty will befall the blasphemers. Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle. Many were the apostles that passed away before him. See, in the minds of these ancient Jewish leaders and our Muslim neighbours, we are threatening the idea of God's majesty by daring to associate God 
with humble flesh and a shameful death on a cross. They see it much better than many Westerners see it. But actually, here is the idea that Tom Holland and many other secular commentators would say has upended the way the West thinks even about God. Christianity has reversed in our mind what it means for God to be majestic, what it means for God to be powerful and glorious. Somehow we think that God is most glorious precisely in his humility. What is a blasphemy is actually the idea that has upended our world and has changed so much the way the West thinks about how power should be used, about what is true goodness. God's greatest glory is his humility, his willingness to show up, share our humanity, and give himself for us. So, I hope I've been able to convey something of my own experience of studying this text that I mentioned at the outset. Reading and studying this text really was uh, like drawing water from a well that just got deeper and deeper and deeper and more beautiful and refreshing and life-giving. Or, or let me change the metaphor. It's like being introduced to someone, not thinking much of it, and then later realising you've been introduced to someone immensely special. I don't, has that ever happened to you? A couple of people at the 8.30 congregation said, oh, yeah, this, this has happened. It happened to me uh, 10 years ago. I was in Wisconsin in the US, and I, uh, I was I introduced to this uh, guy um, named Aaron, and I kept on calling him Adam. <laughs> but it turns out uh, he, he's Aaron Rodgers, the $20 million a year quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, last year's most valuable, official most valuable player in the NFL. I can tell you it's a mistake you only make once. <laughs> Our passage introduces us to a teacher and we end up face to face with God. And that's what changes everything. Countless millions of people have encountered in Christ the God in the flesh, the Saviour, including the renowned Oxford Don and atheist C.S. Lewis. I know I've never quoted Lewis before in this church. <laughs> of course, he went on to write the famous Narnia series and millions of other things. But as he tells it, as an atheist at Oxford University, he, 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 he wrestled with the whole religious thing because one of his best friends was this other lightweight called J.R.R. Tolkien. And they used to go for walks together around the Magdalen College Deer Park, which you must do. I know some of you have done it. And wish you'd been a fly on the wall as this immense mind, Tolkien, this... this revered professor, spoke to this younger scholar about the wisdom embedded in the Christian faith. And as Lewis tells it, he eventually came intellectually to think there must be a God. There must be a one mind behind all the laws of nature. And then he decided, well, I need to know, is there anything more than God's existence you can work out? He was already an expert in the Greek and Roman myths. He was already an expert in the Norse sagas. Then he studied Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Judaism. And he studied these and came to the realisation that God can be seen in Jesus Christ. He stated his conclusion in a little-known essay called What Are We to Make of Jesus Christ? He opens the essay by saying, this is a comical title I've been given. It's like a fly being asked, what do you make of the elephant you sit upon? 
But he said, let's get past that and let's ask the serious question. It's a four-page essay. It is utterly brilliant. It's, I'm going to quote several paragraphs, but have a listen to this. How are we to solve the historical problem set us by the recorded sayings and acts of this man? On the one hand, you have got the almost generally admitted depth and sanity of his moral teaching, which is not very seriously questioned even by those who are opposed to Christianity. On the other hand, there are claims from Jesus' lips which, if not true, are those of a megalomaniac. There is no halfway house and there is no parallel in other religions. If you'd gone to the Buddha and asked him, are you the son of Brahma, the Indian creator god? He would have said, my son, you are still in the veil of illusion. If you'd gone to Muhammad and asked, are you Allah? He would first have rent his clothes and then dealt with you. The idea of a great moral teacher saying what Christ said is out of the question. In my opinion, the only person who can say that sort of thing is either God or a complete lunatic suffering from that form of delusion which undermines the whole mind. Jesus was never regarded as a mere moral teacher. He did not produce that effect on any of the people who actually met him. He produced mainly three effects. Hatred, terror, and adoration. There was no trace of people expressing mild approval. Christianity does not ask for your mild approval of a teacher. That changes nothing and no one. The real action in history and in the lives of individuals, the countless millions, is when people see in Jesus the teacher, healer, and savior who is God in the flesh. That story changes everything. So Lord, will you give us clarity of mind wherever we find ourselves today in faith or doubt. Help us think clearly, logically, but also humbly, honestly about ourselves and about reality. And I pray, Father, for the people who hear me now, that you would help them see in Jesus all of your purposes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Uh, We're glad for the opportunity to uh, ask a few questions and... uh, The mobile phone here is going to buzz crazily with whatever text uh, you send it. In fact, it's already begun doing so. Uh, John, uh, first question asks, if the crowd understands Jesus' claim to forgive, as only only God can do, why didn't they respond more? Um, I don't know what is in the questioner's mind. You, You could think, why didn't they respond more? Uh, meaning, why didn't they get even angrier? And my answer is, well, they did. It only took about two and a half more years for Jesus to be dead. And at his trial, when they say, you know, give it up, he says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Right, so he that drives this point home and, and he is executed for it. So that's on the one hand. On the other, you, you, it could be asked positively, I suppose, why didn't they respond more as in, flock to him and my answer is well, they did they did and, and, and this is why Christianity became uh, the world's first world religion Great. this uh, next question seems to follow on a little from it 
uh, in, in relation to the, the healing of the paralysed man. Jesus forgives the paralysed man and he, ha- and he has... Let me go again. Jesus forgives the paralysed man uh, which he, whom he has healed. Other gospel passages reveal Jesus rebuking those who blamed sinfulness for people with a disability. Yeah. So um, this seems incongruous. Oh, no, not at all. Because Jesus' point is far from uh, this paralyzed man is paralyzed because of his sins. Jesus does not teach that. And, and as the questioner rightly puts it, there are plenty of passages. It, the thing is, he, he's just going for the biggest need of this paralyzed man. I mean, the presenting need is he's paralyzed. But, but Jesus wants to take this opportunity to go for the even, for the even, even deeper uh, problem of this man and every person, uh, forgiveness uh, of sins. Because th- Jesus thinks every person is a sinner. That, that's how Jesus described people. Um, so, yes, it's got nothing to do, uh, nothing to do with that. And, and I'll talk a little more about that uh, next week. Okay. This one's a little off topic, but entirely a very good question. And so I'm going to go with it. <laughs> what historical evidence do you have for the resurrection? Um, uh, man. Um, I told you it was off topic. but It's great. Good. Yeah, we do three hours at Sydney Uni. You should come along. Um, look, the punchline is we have exactly the kind of evidence you'd expect if the resurrection took place. Excellent evidence that even non-Christian scholars agree upon of a number of things. One, it was early. We have evidence from within months that people were saying Jesus had raised his life. So no one thinks it was a growing legend. Two, that there was an empty tomb because even the critics of Christianity in Jerusalem at the time agreed there was an empty tomb. They just blamed the apostles for stealing it. Okay, So that's proof that they thought it was empty. Three, that uh, many people, hundreds in fact, uh, thought they saw Jesus. Now, here's here's the thing where uh, secular, non-Christian historians will even say, we don't know what it is, but we know they thought they saw Jesus. We don't think um, they made it up. You you won't find scholars who think that. You will find scholars who say, there's... um, they claimed they had seen him, and the reason we're pretty convinced they actually thought they saw him rather than they made it up is uh, that many of them um, were abused and imprisoned and lost livelihoods, and several of the key eyewitnesses died for their faith. Now, before you say, oh, but every, you know, lots of people die for their faiths, you know, martyrs die for their faith, this is a totally different category. These are the people who knew if it was made up or not, right? If I die for my faith, it only tells you, oh, John was really sincere. Uh Uh-huh. My point is, Peter, Paul, James, John, and so on, if they die for their faith, they're the ones who know if the whole thing were made up. And they died with that message on their lips, having gained nothing in this life as a result of the claim. The other thing we know is uh, that women were the first eyewitnesses. And I know that seems like an obvious thing nowadays, women finding things before the men do. Um, um, In the ancient world, it was a problem and did cause the Christians problem because um, um, bigoted uh, male Greeks and Romans said, no, the whole story is based on women's testimony. I rest my case. Old wives' tale. But actually, the the Gospels are all clear. The women were the first to witness it. There's no way they would have invented that and caused themselves problems until the 21st century when it sounds cool that women found the empty tomb. Um, so, anyway, uh, there, there's a, there's a, there's a three-hour version, but that'll, that'll do. Uh, but my point is, uh, we have exactly the kind of evidence you'd expect, and way more evidence pointing in the direction of the resurrection than you could possibly expect if it were made up. Now, of course, if you don't think there's a God in the universe who could raise people from the dead, doesn't matter how much evidence you found, you're just going to say, no, 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 no. But you just need to be honest with yourself. It's not evidence that's your problem. It's your background belief that there's no God. Uh, John, 
So many questions tumbling into the oh, phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. Well, they did ask a big one then. They, they did, uh, and thank you. Um, so I'm just going to go with this, this last one, if that's okay with you, John. Sure. Um, and it takes us back on, onto our topic. Yeah. Uh, asking, um, I'm just going to interpret what this person has written, but asking about that vision of the son of man. It mm. says, uh, how can we know that the vision seen in the Old Testament was true, this vision of the son of man? Uh, well, even if it's not, um, the, the, the point is it was a vision, okay, um, with, that someone had and it was recorded. Let's just say it's false, okay? The point is, everyone knew what the title Son of Man meant. So it, whether the vision happened or not, which I do believe it, it did happen, but let's leave that aside. The fact that Jesus used a title everyone knew was a divine title of the one worthy of all worship. The fact that he consciously used that title of himself when he did the one thing only God could do, forgiveness of sins, puts the pressure on a thinking adult like C.S. Lewis. What do you make of that? See, so many of us think, oh, he was such a wise and sane teacher. And Lewis's point was, I got to the point where I could not believe that if I didn't also accept what this wise, sane, wise teacher also said about himself. He is either a megalomaniac, which undermines everything he said about love and humility and all the rest of it, or he, or he is what he said he was. Yeah, the teacher, the healer, the saviour, God in the flesh. And when someone like Lewis submitted to that logical flow, it changed his life, it changed my life. And that's the challenge I'm putting out to us all today. John, thank you very much. Well, a warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name's Neil Hughes, if we haven't met before. I'm a regular here at 10.30. I uh, just want to extend my warm welcome to, to everyone here and online, whether it's your regular, it's your first time, you're with us especially for this series, whether someone sort of brought you along, you're just most very welcome. I'm really enjoying having you here today. And you picked a good day. We're going to um, read the Bible shortly. Um, and then John Dixon is going to take us through the last talk in his series. Um, there's going to be some time for some Q&A. Uh, today there'll be a time of prayer. Um, we're especially going to consider Reconciliation Week, which is an extremely important week, uh, I think, for the nation and for the Christian community alike. And I'm also pleased to say that after the service today, we're going to be engaging in a morning tea for the first time in a very long time. So if you need to sort of quickly jump on the text and message people, hey, you're at home, you're online, get down here, there's biscuits, now's the time. So as I mentioned, we've, we've been working through this three-part series, which is going to conclude today, titled The Story That Changes Everything. Week one, um, John took us through the main points about Christianity being biographical, historical, humble and personal. Last week, he took us through the, the idea of Jesus, the teacher, the healer, the saviour, and God. We looked at Mark chapter 2 and the story of the paralysed man. And for me personally, the, the powerful message was when there's a line there that Jesus saw their faith. Now, he reacted based on their faith. Not the fact that there were lots of people around. You know, you've got a big crowd you might think, well, I've got to do something. All these people have come to see me. I need to impress them. You know, I know that the focus groups have told me that if I perform a miracle here, it's going to do great for my brand out in society. No. It was personal. It was based on the paralysed men and the faith of the four men who lowered him down from the roof. That's a personal decision. And they took action. We don't know the exact details of the paralysed man's disability, but I would think he had some sort of way of making it known if he didn't want to be lowered down by his friends. So even the paralysed man, allowing that process to happen, is a personal response. And on the back of that, Jesus had a personal response. John talked about 
reading and studying the passage and how it was like drawing water from a well. I felt really challenged by John and, and when he talked around that fact, that he was drawing and drinking this water. And that's been the focus for his whole life. Again, this is very personal. And John, in his personal journey, has gone back to the well over and over again. It is, it is personal, but it's also required an action on his behalf. There's no rules or laws within what we've been talking about which says, John, you must go and read Mark chapter 2 this many times. It was the actions on his behalf. Excuse me one second. And it was John's action that had formed his career and his life today. The story that changed everything. So fine, I just want to touch on this idea of the story. So the story can be, well, a story can be an account of an imaginary or a real person, like in a, in a movie or a book. It can be a news item, you know, either you know, the, the, the traditional six o'clock news or something online. It can be, a story can be a piece of gossip or a rumour, or it can be a testimony or a statement. What type of story is it going to be for you? It's going to be personal in terms of how it makes you feel, what you believe, what action you take, and ultimately your personal relationship with God. But when it comes to your personal relationship with God, no two stories are the same. It's you and God. Now, before we hear from God's word via the Bible reading, I just there's a couple of two bits of housekeeping I just want to touch on. Um, we have the parents' room sort of directly below me here. So it's just a room. It's, 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 I've been in there this morning. It's lovely. The sun's shining in. There's a live stream set up. There's no pressure to go there, but it's just an option if anyone feels that they'd like to spend some time down the parents' room. There's some toys, plenty of space. Feel free to um, head down there. You can either go outside and around the building or through the front door here. Um, there's also an opportunity at the end of John's sermon where we're going to have some questions via text message. So take a note of that number, send them through, and we'll get through as many as we can um, as time permits. Thank you. We'll have the Bible reading now. The Bible reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 2, verse 13 to verse 17. Mark 2, beginning at verse 13. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the righteous. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Good to see you all again. When I was first introduced to the Christian faith, uh, I sincerely thought that all Christians were like this passage implies, celebratory, willing to sit down and welcome everyone, dining with sinners and saints alike. And you might ask, uh, why on earth would you have that happy assumption? Had you not met Christians? Well, I had met one. I had a sample of one. Uh, This woman, 
And uh, I know I have mentioned her many times in this church. In fact, uh, she read the Bible and led the prayers at my induction uh, as rector of this church. She stood right here doing it. But I originally met her as my scripture teacher at Mossman High School in year nine. And she was smart and funny and had answers to all my smart aleck questions. And a key thing about her is that she was really into hosting these giant feasts at her place. And I'm always up for that. And um, Friday afternoons after schools, uh, school, she'd invite uh, people back and uh, make us hamburgers and milkshakes and scones and then read to us from the Gospels. Like she'd just read a story, like we have just read a story today, and then field our questions. That's really the pattern of my ministry, it just dawned on me. <laughs> Reading the Gospels and answering questions. Um, and as many of you know, uh, this was the doorway uh, into faith for me and for my best mate, Ben, and for a whole bunch of us. And you know, when she died, uh, four years ago, um, her family <laughs> prepared for everyone at the funeral, giant funeral, a cookbook because she was such a foodie. Um, and, uh, and, and they distributed it to everyone with her you know, secret recipes to everything, including her scones recipe. Can you see what they named the scones? Salvation scones in honour of uh, us. They used to call us the scone scoffers. Boy, did we scoff. Her scones. Anyway, um, she put up with so much from us. Um, I don't just mean that sometimes we turned up with 20 mates when she was expecting five or six, uh, or other times didn't turn up at all when she'd made hamburgers, milkshakes and scones waiting for us. I mean stuff like we turned up at her home at midnight completely blind drunk. I mean the way we... Uh, stole from her. Uh, not me personally, I won't name the fiend, but uh, one Friday afternoon when she was out of the room, someone took her DVD player, which I suppose was a VCR player, but anyway. <laughs> and the next week, all she said was, I seem to have misplaced my, uh, my VCR player. And boy, that was uh, an awkward moment. And not because she guilted us, almost the opposite. Um, we knew she suspected us. And she hardly said anything about it. And she still wanted us in, in her home. Man, oh man. In those days, I had no idea there were bigoted Christians. No idea. I had no idea there were Christians who would look down their nose at you who would count your behaviour as a reason not to befriend you, not to have you at their table. Of course, I learnt that eventually when I started going to church and realised that not all Christians are like Glenda. I tell you this because Glenda epitomised one of the most remarkable features of the historical life of Jesus. He whined and dined with those classed sinners. And the sinners uh, responded by inviting all their sinner buddies over to meet Jesus. And right on cue, the religious leaders were aghast, as our passage makes clear. Um, in nerdy academic circles, this is called the problem of table fellowship. And it is one of the very strange things about the life of Jesus, because um, eating with people in antiquity was um, far more socially significant than it is uh, for us today. Here's um, Graham Stanton of Cambridge, I think putting it well. Sharing a meal with a friend today is often no more than a convenient way of consuming food. In the Greco-Roman and Jewish world of the first century, however, eating food with another person was far more significant socially. It indicated that the invited person was being accepted into a relationship in which the bonds were as close as in family relations. One normally invited to meals and accepted invitations, only people whom one considered social and religious equals. 
Jesus' openness to whining and dining with the tax collectors and sinners was historically remarkable. But it's not just history. This changed so many things. It is of huge spiritual significance. Uh, For the church, yes, as it thinks about its stance toward the sinful world. For wider society, as it thinks about what is genuine Christianity. And I'll put it to you, significant for all of us, as we ponder the perennial dilemma of our moral failings and guilt and all the rest. This is a story that changes everything, so uh, let's dive in. Our passage is really part B of last week's uh, passage. Um, The two stories are linked geographically and thematically. Um, Last week, if you weren't here, uh, we found Jesus teaching in this same city, town really, uh, Capernaum, a real place on a real map that you can go to and stomp around the first century houses. And Jesus in that scene um, made the extraordinary claim that he had the authority to forgive sins, which only God could possibly do. And of course, the religious leaders thought he was blaspheming because who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, our text takes us out of this Capernaum home down to the beach at Capernaum. And I know some of you have been down to the beach at Capernaum. About 100 metres away from where the previous scene was set. And down here at the beach, there's a bustling crowd. The fishermen bringing in their hauls. The uh, marketplace is set up right along the shore. The tax collectors are there collecting their duties and making their profits. And people are flocking to hear Jesus, as we just read. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him. And he began to teach them. As he walked along, so you've got to picture a crowd. He's teaching them and walking along. What's he doing? Where's he going? He saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Now, here's the connection. Not only is it the same city. No sooner has Jesus demonstrated his authority to forgive sins up in the house by healing the paralyzed man. No sooner has he done that than he is down the beach looking for more sinners to forgive. And he arrives at a certain tax collector's booth. Now, this is just a mobile uh, setup, right? A table um, with uh, boxes, jars for coins, and a little booth to keep the tax collector nice and comfortable. And Jesus fronts up to a particular tax collector and issues his signature call. Follow me. Follow me. Now, this isn't the first time these exact crowds have heard Jesus say to people, follow me. A few months earlier, in Capernaum, we read this from the previous chapter, Mark 1. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, we call him the Apostle Peter, and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And this too was in Capernaum, as I say, a few months earlier. So by the time we get to our scene, people are probably already wondering, Who's next? Who's going to get the call to become a student of the most famous teacher of the moment? I think we can safely assume nobody was expecting it would be a tax collector. Least of all the tax collectors. And yet that's exactly what happened. See, tax collectors, unlike our lovely, white-collar, working, diligent tax collectors at the ATO, Lord bless you, keep you, Ancient tax collectors had a terrible reputation and totally deserved, partly because they were seen as collaborators with Rome, the occupying power, because some of the taxes they collected went directly to Rome and some of the other taxes went to the Rome-appointed ruler of Galilee, 
whose name was Antipas. But more than that, they were greedy. They were renowned for fleecing people because there were so few checks and balances in ancient taxation that basically this is how it worked. Once a tax collector had delivered to the higher-ups, the authorities, uh, the agreed amount, they were able to make their living by anything they could cream off the top from their local population. And so it was so open to abuse, and they abused it. In fact, there's a humorous statue from this very period uh, to, a, to a tax collector. It says, to Sabinus, an honest tax collector. It was obviously, you know, a rare occasion and remarkable. I guess it's a bit like saying an honest car salesman. And um, I apologise uh, to any car salesman in the building. I, I love you. And, of course, Jesus loves everyone. Um, but, but I did just notice that Roy Morgan uh, just announced the 2021 most and least trusted professions. And um, car salesmen are the, the bottom. And uh, nurses and doctors right at the top where they belong. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid to say uh, ministers right around the middle with only about 30% of people thinking ministers are trustworthy. Um, so why is Jesus dining with a tax collector and his buddies? While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners, it's like the word went out, were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? These Pharisees are a faction within ancient Judaism uh, that was really into purity. In fact, the word Pharisee comes from the Hebrew term that means uh, to separate. And their whole way of thinking was that you had to separate from people and things that would make you unclean, spiritually speaking. And many of the rules of the Pharisees have survived in a text uh, called the Mishnah. So we actually know sort of behind the scenes what some of these Pharisees were thinking. Here's a section about tax collectors entering your home, all right? So you get a sense from this of the problem Jesus was creating by whining and dining with them. Concerning thieves who enter your house, only the place trodden by the feet of the thieves is unclean, and they render unclean in those rooms the foods and the liquids, the clay utensils which are open, but the couches and the seats and the clay utensils which are sealed with a tight seal are clean. Concerning tax collectors who enter your house, the whole house is unclean. So, when Jesus goes into the home of a tax collector with a house full of sinners and tax collectors, he was, according to the religious rules of the day, contaminating himself. Why? And I'd be tempting to say, oh, Jesus was just like, an ancient party animal, and any opportunity to, you know, to wine and dine with friends, he was, he was up for that. But of course, something much more is going on here. This is another example of Jesus' authority to forgive sins. That's what's happening here. Sinners don't contaminate him. He somehow cleanses them. And not just the sympathetic characters either, like the paralyzed man up in the house there in Capernaum. I mean, you'd almost think someone like that, you know, hard life, deserves forgiveness, it's understandable. No, I, I mean the openly corrupt and irreligious people like Levi and his buddies. This is really important to understand. Levi was not this sort of lowly social outcast you know, who needed the company inclusion officer to make sure he was feeling safe. That's not what's going on here. Levi is doing fine. He's got means. He's got petty control over the population. 
He's got people he can invite to parties. The complaints of the Pharisees aren't entirely unreasonable, right? A strong moral case can be made that a holy teacher like Jesus should not invite into his school someone like Levi, should not accept the invitation to eat at the table of Levi with all of his sinful buddies. Graham Stanton of Cambridge puts this well. The sinners were not simply apathetic about religious observance. They were those who intentionally ignored God's commandments. So Jesus insisted on accepting openly in intimate table fellowship those who were notorious for their dishonesty or their high-handed rejection of the law. It's really important to spot this. Jesus wasn't like just a social lefty who takes the side of sympathetic characters, you know, makes them feel welcome. He is the Lord and saviour of everyone. He wants to mend everyone. And that's actually what he goes on to say to the grumbling Pharisees. He's the divine doctor for those who need an eternal remedy. On hearing this grumbling, Jesus said to them, these religious leaders, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, what does this mean? Some interpret Jesus here as being a little bit sarcastic, like just having a little dig at the Pharisees who think they're healthy and don't need a doctor, who think they're righteous and therefore don't need a saviour. That's possible. It's possible. It's also possible Jesus really just means there are some people who are good with God. Not good in the moral sense. I'm afraid to say Jesus thought everyone was a fallen creature, hardly lives up to their own standards, let alone God's. But Jesus did think some people had come to terms with that and had reconciled with God. They were already good with God. Um, Either way, whichever is the correct interpretation of that, and I change my mind every few days, The point is this, Jesus came to find sinners, whether the sympathetic characters or the complete jerks, and mend them back to God. In the previous scene, he literally mended the paralyzed man as a demonstration that he had the power to forgive sins too. And now, in this scene, he is actively seeking out the jerks, welcoming them, forgiving them. This isn't mere liberal-mindedness on the part of Jesus. It's the work of the divine doctor. It's the work of the saviour who came for us all. And, of course, he will walk these shores for another year, year and a half, seeking out more and more people, and then he'll head south to Jerusalem, where he'll be arrested by the religious authorities, handed over to the Roman elites, and crucified. And if you read this narrative, it is crystal clear Jesus knows what he's doing the whole way. Uh, This is the point. He is making amends for sinners. The reason he can hand out God's forgiveness like it's his to give because it is his to give is because he would bear into himself the guilt of the paralyzed man, of Levi, of you and me. You may see yourself as a sympathetic character. You may know yourself to be deeply flawed. What this narrative tells us is that either way we need God's forgiveness and Jesus has come for us to mend us, to remedy us back to God. For my um, podcast a few weeks ago, I interviewed Bill McClay, who's a history professor at the University of Oklahoma and the author of one of the most 
fascinating essays I have read in the last years. Um, it's called The Strange Persistence of Guilt. And it's a kind of history of the concept of guilt. I know that doesn't sound like really awesome, but I thought it was, and I, I think the pod with him is awesome. But basically, he runs through the way philosophers and psychologists um, in the 19th, 20th centuries tried to manage guilt. And so he, he first uh, deals with Friedrich Nietzsche, the great atheist in the 19th century, who uh, basically said, because there's no God, there's no moral law, no objective moral law, there's just social norms. And so if there's no moral law, no moral law giver, no guilt. Problem solved. But of course, the problem wasn't solved. Shortly afterwards, Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology, comes along and tried to deal with the problem of subjective guilt, not objective guilt. He agreed with Nietzsche there was no objective guilt because there's no lawgiver, no God. But guilt lingers. And Freud actually argued that many of our psychological maladies are simply um, morphed or displaced guilt, that guilt is pervasive. The most interesting thing I wanted to interview Bill McClay about is not really this history of guilt stuff. It's how, with the demise of Christianity in our culture, Western culture doesn't have many ways of speaking about guilt anymore and has lost the tools to manage guilt. And this is not a Christian essay. He doesn't offer a Christian solution. He just sort of narrates the, the different ways you can see in Western culture, especially in recent decades, an attempt, secular attempts, to cope with guilt. And I think his uh, three ways secular Western culture try to assuage guilt are fascinating. See if they ring a bell for you. He says, first, there is an obsession with therapeutic measures. We assuage guilt through counselling, through self-improvement courses and books. Now, please don't mishear me. He is not against counselling. He acknowledges that there is sort of false guilt that, that crushes people, all of that. But there is this obsession to remove any sense of guilt through these self-improvement measures. Secondly, he says, there's a growing severity in mob shaming. We cope with our own guilt, our own sense that we don't measure up, by ferociously mob attacking even worse sinners than us. And so by comparison, we're okay. And thirdly, he says, there's a rush to identify with or as victims. I mean, we all sort of see victims as Guilt-free, all right? So, he argues, if we ourselves are victims, or at least if we are the friends of victims, right? We identify with victims. We must be the righteous. Now, Maclay doesn't offer a Christian solution. He just says, these are historical and sociological trends that don't look very healthy. But actually, there is a solution. Become a patient of the divine doctor. A student of this teacher. He will welcome you to his table. He will forgive you all your sins. The understandable ones and the outlandish ones. He will make you well with God. We just can't remove guilt by pretending we're good through and through, through religion, through self-help, through mob shaming, through thinking of ourselves only as victims. Actual forgiveness is the solution. Actual forgiveness. And that comes because of Jesus Christ. The perfect life he lived on our behalf, offered up on a cross, bearing our guilt and shame, bearing our judgment, and rising again in history 
to guarantee this as a reality for you and for me. That is a story that changes everything. That is a story that changes everything. But I have to say, there must be a moment of acceptance for this to become real. It isn't automatic. I mean, last week, um, it was when Jesus saw their faith that he gave forgiveness. In uh, the passage we just read, Levi got up and followed him and invited Jesus into his home, his moment of acceptance. For me, as I said earlier, my moment was sitting on the couch of Glenda Weldon, eating her scones, listening to her read the Gospels, and somewhere in there, I don't actually remember the very moment, but I remember the feeling, I think I trust him. <laughs> like, she would be reading, and, and I just felt I trusted this one. For my friend, Aisha, her moment of acceptance happened in church one day. In this church one day, actually. I know some of you know her real name. I have to be circumspect because I know we're live streaming. And she comes from a country where it's illegal to become a Christian. Where it's a family shame to become a Christian. But I'll never forget. She was sitting about where Zoran's sitting. She'd been investigating Christianity with her intellect. Very smart cookie. She'd had her answers to the difficult questions, but then one day it clicked that she was not good, that she could not make amends herself, that the only way is to trust the mender of all things, Jesus Christ. But you've got to hear it in her own words. In my mind, um, Islam and Sharia was an idealistic way to live, which could lead you to heaven on earth, and that's what we're attempting. So to, it, it took a long period of time for me to realize that laws do not change the core of what a person is. And that was one of the bigger changes in my thinking. So what was it that tipped you over the edge to say, oh my goodness, I'm a Christian? I tried really hard to be good. <laughs> Um, for, for around a month when I was still wrestling and everything was You managed a month being really good, did you? I, I, I tried. I was, I'm very stubborn. <laughs> and I tried, okay, tomorrow I'm not going to be annoyed by this colleague of mine or I'm going to be more patient. And I came home and I said, I can't do it. And it took a lot of convincing for me to realize that I'm not as good as I think I am. And I then took communion at, at um, this church. And I remember because I was crying in the pews and I was trying to hide my face, <laughs> but I was utterly broken at that point. So. And that was a kind of moment where you said, you can't save yourself, okay. but here is the gift yeah. that's yours. And how often do you get a God trying to make amends for what you've done? Her central discovery was the discovery of Levi, my discovery. We are not good. We cannot make amends. Christ the doctor, Christ the saviour, gave himself for us to make amends. And what a profound question she asks. How often do you get a God who makes amends for what we have done? The answer is, once, in the history of ideas, once. And that is the story that changes everything. So Lord, will you please um, give us good, clear thinking this morning about uh, these issues in the gospel but also about ourselves, Lord. Help us to be uh, humble thinkers. 
And I do especially pray for those in the building who just aren't sure what to make of all this. Help them to make uh, the little steps in the right direction and ultimately to find you. But maybe, Lord, there are some here who just want to make amends today by receiving your gift of Jesus Christ who made amends for us. So, Lord, please grant us insight into your mercy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, John. We're going to go into a, a, a Q&A session now. Um, I'll attempt to decipher these questions as they come through. I think we're going to start quite broad and then I'll try and bring it a bit narrow. Sure. Why do you think God waited to send Jesus at this point in time in history and not before? What about people in the centuries before, in earlier ancient history? Why did he wait? Yeah. I mean, at one level, the answer is we don't know. At another level, um, the answer is whenever it happened, the people either side of it would complain. Wouldn't they? I mean, whenever it happened in human history, um, you'd say, why not in my era? You know, my era would be much better, okay, because I'm here. Um, so I think when you think it through, uh, you can just sort of say God knew pretty good time. And, and I think uh, you'd have to all agree it worked out pretty well, given Christianity was the first world religion, given it is the largest religion by hundreds of millions, um, is booming all around China and Africa and Iran. This story of, you know, the demise of Christianity is a complete myth that is just uh, a very Euro-focused, very Anglo-focused experience. So um, I could also speculate about it was a great time because the Roman roads meant missionary travel was easy and, you know, there was a common language, ancient Greek. But I think they're all just speculations. I would just say it was perfect and it turned out pretty well. Fair enough. Now, if we go into a person of the time... If Levi saw himself as doing fine, as you expressed this, why did he get up and follow? Um, I often think, what's the backstory? Um, what's the backstory here? And, and Mark doesn't tell us. Mark is furiously trying to get to the punchline. If you, if you read Mark's gospel, you just get a little story like this, and, and actually in Greek, nearly every paragraph begins, uh, Euthus. Euthus, Euthus, which is immediately, immediately, immediately. It's like Mark is going, I'm, I'm heading somewhere. And where he's heading is Jesus dying and rising, right? And, and so what that means is there's so much backstory that Mark could have told us that would have been psychologically compelling, but we don't know. So one can imagine that Jesus, who's been to Capernaum many times, uh, Levi, you imagine Levi, he knows he's a jerk. He, he knows that... His trade is almost inherently greedy. And maybe he's heard a bit of the Jesus preaching from the back of the crowd. And I like to think that he'd been pondering that and hating every time he fleeced someone and just wondering, was there, was there remedy? And he heard that Jesus had come to town and he wondered, was there a place for me? I couldn't get into the house up there. There was no room, you know there and then what do you know one day Jesus strolls along the beach with a great big crowd and it looks like Jesus has got him by name and so the words follow me are like life and mercy and I think his response to throw a big party and invite all his <laughs> sinner buddies is it just gives away that there's, there's this backstory here that we don't quite know and I think too you know it's a very modern concept that we like to think, well, I want to I figure this out. You know, Levi, I want to understand him circumstance. How does that relate to me? Ultimately, we try and join the dots. Yeah. Um, so we, we, you mentioned this ancient table fellowship yeah. as, as a concept. What, I'm going to merge a couple of questions here. What is the modern version of table fellowship? Um, and how can we use that to um, make this message radical 
once again? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a very Christian question. Um, uh, I, all I know is that when I entered into Christianity with someone who had nailed this, right? I, and I honestly didn't think there was such a thing as a narrow-minded, judgmental, bigoted Christian. But interestingly, Glenda was not, um, like, socially lefty or, you know, like, oh, just live however you like, right? She hated the fact that we drank a lot and did other things. Um, but in some ways, it, it was her continuing love for us and welcome of us that scorched. In, in a way, it, you know, it, she didn't have to say, now, boys, you mustn't be getting drunk and you mustn't be chasing girls and you mustn't be stealing and all this, right? And, you know, the, the normal going for our guilt sort of thing. Actually, I'm sure we wouldn't have brought that message. But it, it was the fact that she spoke of this one in all his love and purity and welcomed us with such love that made me feel so like, uh, um, I struggle to find the words, but scorched, that I'm, I'm unworthy of this love. Especially when we started nicking things from her. And, and, and that was life-changing. And, of course, it was a great pointer to the Christian message that she was... I mean, it wasn't a ploy on her part. It was just the embodiment of what she was saying. She was saying God was like that. He welcomes you to his table and he knows everything you've ever done, said and thought. Probably the turning point for me, I know I'm giving more than I should. Um, I went up to her after class one day because she taught these once a week scripture classes. And I said, I'm not saying God's real because um, I'd never been in a church before, right? I'm not saying God's real, but what do you think he thinks of me? And she said, John, God sees everything you've done, said and thought. And paused, just like I'm pausing now, and I can remember thinking, that's not very good. <laughs> and then she said, but he loves you even still. God sees everything you've done, said and thought, and he loves you even still. Man, oh man, those two thoughts went around around my head. And so when she invited us to her home, it made, it, you know, that was, that was the idea I was wrestling with. I can't even remember if I've answered the question. Um, but it's a, it's a good answer to some question. And it's, um, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's beautiful context around a, pers oh, yeah, a person. Oh, yeah, it's more like, what the, oh, I don't know, just, just be like Glenda. Um, or, or let me put it better, let's just be like Jesus Christ. So this is going to be our final question, and we're going from big, big to narrow here. Um, if we think about your journey personally, um, you talked about that moment where you came to believe. Um, I think whether you're a long-standing Christian, exploring, you know, compl you know, completely against, just whatever range you're in, how it's, it's that whole concept, and I just want to get your personal take on um, your experience around, let's term it, the, the leap of faith. So that intellect, you've got all these predetermined thoughts and f feelings, but you've changed. What, how did you, talk to me just briefly about the, the process and what did it look like? I mean, and it's going to look different for every, every person, but it was, it was as simple as finding myself thinking um, when she would read the Gospels to us, I, I trust this person. Everything he said, I trusted. Um, his attitude toward sinners and religion, I trusted that attitude. Um, his death on the cross, I thought, my goodness, that was for me. His resurrection, it was like, man, this, this must be real now because he's not dead. Right? It, it was just the realisation that this was for me and I accepted it. I, I accepted it. And it was like he'd welcomed me to his table. And I know that's, you know, not a kind of do these three things and you'll be a Christian. But, it, but in fact, one of the things I've been stressing is Christianity is sort of not like that. I can tell you exactly how to become a Buddhist because there's a special ritual. I can tell you exactly how to become a Jew, how to become a Muslim. There are actual rituals and actual words you must say. It just isn't like that with Christianity because it's too personal. It's about our inner life, finding ourselves trusting this one. Not a concept, but this one. When you trust him, he has welcomed you. Which is both a gift and a curse because it's relying on you 
to make your own determination. Yeah. yeah. So as you're trying to make that determination, um, I just want you to consider, I know the last few weeks we've been talking about the Life of Jesus course. Um, this, Can I this, down? Yes, go for it. This, this course is for everyone. Um, if you're exploring, come along. If no one has all the answers, if you think you've all the answers, you should definitely come along. Um, it's just, it's a great time to sit and learn more. Um, and setting aside some time for that, I think, is a, is a great thing that I would encourage you all to do. So um, we're just going to see a, a short video now around the, the course, and then we're going to have a time of prayer. It's as if Christianity places its neck on the chopping block of academic scrutiny and invites anyone who wishes to come and take a swing. Which is why historians in universities all over the world feel at liberty to look at the Christian's holy book called the New Testament as a simple historical text. A lot of people have a big problem with Christianity, but most people have a lot of time for Jesus himself. Mm. But they do actually develop their own versions of who Jesus is in order to suit their purposes. And a lot of people take Jesus' life and his teachings and they sort of magnify some part of it out of proportion in order to make their own point. And so you get Jesus, the anti-capitalist and the socialist, because he told his disciples to share their possession. The kingdom of God wasn't coming in a tornado of judgment on the ungodly. He said it would start small, almost unnoticed. On one occasion, he referred to mustard seeds, one of the smallest known at the time, and he said, the kingdom of God is like this. Just so you're picturing this on the right scale, keep in mind that the temple structure was 500 metres by 300 metres. 12 football fields would fit into its area. And Jesus stood up here and accused the temple authorities of turning God's house into a den of thieves. 